Hello and welcome to this session. I am Lucie Jarbert, working at IBM in the role and passionate about sustainability and working to fight climate change. Today, I will be talking to you about responsible computing and how you can start implementing it at scale within your company. As you probably know already, if you came to this session, we need to start thinking differently about technology. It's all of our media and your sources. We have Cambridge Analytica, the dark side of social media, data breaches, and Bitcoin data centers, and AI using up the world's energy. The way IBM decided to address this was through the Responsible Computing Framework. The framework is split into six main categories, three about social topics, so impact, system, and data usage, and three more about technology, so data center, infrastructure, and code. My focus was on code, and I'm guessing yours would have been too. So what is responsible code? Responsible code is to be aware of the potential environmental, societal, and economic impact your design and requirement choices could have, and how you can minimize their negative impact. Now, we've seen already some of the negative impact of technology, but I still want to spend a minute on the impact of IT on our environment. Indeed, digital sources amount to 4% of the global green as gas emission, so twice that of aviation, and it's important to understand where most of our work is uh, if we want to reduce the impact on our environment. So first, what are the kind of impact IT can have on our environment? So obviously there is the energy use, and a greenhouse gas emission associated to it. Uh, we have the water consumption to create new equipment and the depletion of resources, again uh, linked to the creation of equipment. And out of all of this, a study by Green IT ranked by categories with numbers. Uh, it's an approximation, obviously, uh, as you can guess, these are numbers that are quite hard to estimate precisely, uh, especially since they are spread around four categories. Uh, so, as you can see, data centers that are often depicted as villain are at the bottom of the impact hierarchy uh, for digital services, both at the energy consumption and manufacturing level. Uh, it doesn't mean we don't have to do things uh, to reduce the in impact, but uh, it shows that we can have a huge impact at the user level, uh, especially regarding the manufacturing of equipment. So the manufacturing of user equipment is responsible for more than half of the impact. Uh, as developer, our biggest focus should be around making sure that our software and apps are fast and light to remove as much as possible the need for users to upgrade their hardware to match their software needs. So now let's talk about how we can reduce the impact of code on our environment. Step one is to remove unnecessary features and code. Uh, the same way you would say the best trash is one that does not exist about pollution, you can say the same about code. So the best code slash feature is one that does not exist. Removing useless feature in your code will inevitably reduce the impact of your app, uh, obviously, because we will need less uh, computing power, less energy to run it, and uh, less data will be hosted. An example of design choices that you need to always remove is autoplay because you use data and energy to run the video that might not even interest the user. And also if you have users that are visually impaired, it might mess with their experience on your web page. So you can also think about lowering the requirements. So for example, if you use an AI model in your app, you might have seen that training them is quite resource intensive. So switching maybe from a 98% recognition to a 95 or 90, might be enough for your use case, and usually the last percent are the other ones to get, so lowering the bar can save quite a bit of energy. And uh, while designing your app, you want to really keep only what is necessary. So rethink all of your ideas, track what feature user use and don't use to only keep the best and most interesting feature. So that is digital minimalism. So now that all unnecessary things are removed, you want to make sure that the code that is left follows a certain hygiene that will help on social, economic, and environmental areas. So first off, you want clean and reusable code. That way, the resources you've spent while developing your code, so human and economic and computing resources, 
uh, will not be wasted because you have to redevelop your app. Second, you want code that is inclusive. Think of everyone with disability. Uh, we are lucky enough in the web area to have a standard that is called the WCAG 2.1. Uh, so you just need to have an AA rating on this one. Um, IBM also made a website available for you with tools to test accessibility uh, of your web page. And you also want your code to not further the digital divide, meaning make it work for people that are not as technology savvy as you are or have a bad internet connection. And finally, you want inclusivity in your illustration videos and forms so that everyone feels included on your website and uh, stay wary of biases in AI models, APIs or data sets you are working with. And once you've done all that, uh, you will need to optimize your code. So as said previously, most of the impact of digital services happen in the creation of different terminals. So the best way of reducing our impact is to fight against obsolescence and having to upgrade the hardware to match software needs. Uh, so when we use more RAM and CPU, our computer usually goes slower and that drives the want in consumer to upgrade to a new and faster computer, uh, which is the main issue we have right now. So optimizing your code and looking at KPIs such as cycle count, CPU consumption, memory usage, network calls, size of your page is the way to go to try to keep resources usage as low as possible and to fight obsolescence. So now I will show you a few tools that you can use right now to give you insights on your web page and what you can change. Uh, so it goes from a uh, seeing if your site is fast to best practices that you might want to implement. Another way to optimize your code is to use well-known and certified libraries. Uh, usually they already are optimized to the best of what is possible out there. So you do not have to spend your time optimizing the code yourself. Uh, however, if you do use that, do stay careful of possible data breaches when using public libraries. Now that we have looked through all of this, you might think, well, it's all fine and well, but I'm not alone in my team and I do not have the full creative power over the application. That's true. And that's what we'll focus on for the rest of the presentation. So how do we get everyone to be on the same team? So let me tell you about my story and the way I started acting to make sustainability more of a common topic to be discussed. Uh, so that everyone in my team thinks about it, not just me. So when I first started working within my company, I looked around and I saw so many things that could change and that needed to change. Um, and I think we all do. One of that things was about a very specific topic on sustainability. And lucky enough, I found someone else that wanted to do something about it around a coffee machine. Uh, so we started getting in touch with the person in charge of said things to discuss possible changes. And while talking to them, we found out that we had been approached by two other people on the topic. So I wasn't alone trying to change things. All I needed to do was to find others like me and uh, start working on things together. Uh, so us four gathered and we started talking about all the things we thought we needed to change. And let me tell you, we were creative and had big ideas. The thing about big dreams is that you need to put in the work to make sure that you can reach them. And the first thing to us that matter was that we needed to be taken seriously and not just as idealists, uh, as might be the case when it came to sustainability a few years ago, and still do. Uh, so we worked hard on making professional presentations the same way we will do if we were talking to a client. Uh, even if it was all about internal topics and not a business related one. So we started by creating a structure that could scale to get more people in. And then we made branding. So we had a logo and a catchy name that was current with our company's brand. So if you do the same, make sure that the people in charge of the brand for your company know about your project, uh, otherwise uh, you might get in trouble because there is a lot of legal aspect linked to branding. So that's why we trust to keep our branding internal and I'm not showing it to you right now. Then we chose a project that we knew would be achievable and that we were passionate about. 
uh, but we will be starting to have an impact and not just be about talking but also action. Uh, we believe this will also give us more credibility when presenting our project later, especially to executives. Once we had a solid base, we started expanding and finding people like us uh, that were interested about sustainability and wanted to act. Uh, that way we started to grow and work on more projects and uh, we ended up with quite a big community. So now if you want to do the same, I can give you some advice of what I found and learned along the way. So first, start small, then scale. Uh, this is key because in the beginning you will encounter a lot of setback and it will require a lot of on top work. So you will need to be passionate about what you are doing in order to not lose interest and motivation. Uh, so focus on one project with people you trust and make it become a reality. Uh, that way you will learn a lot about the internal dynamics within your company. You want also to create a structure that will survive scaling. Uh, you want to create a brand to have more impact. You want to find leaders and people in position of power that will support and help your project and community. Uh, otherwise, again, uh, you will not go far. Uh, and once you've done all of that, you will then want to find more people uh, to work on your project. So now let me go into the final tips and tricks to creating your community. So in the beginning, do not count your hours. Uh, creating community takes time. You have to work on branding, structure, presentation. You also need to onboard new people and find sponsors. So as you can guess, it takes quite some time. Uh, also, most people you will talk to uh, when working on project uh, will be on board to help you, but most of the time you have to remind yourself that you are adding to their workload. So if you want your project to become a reality, you really need to help them as much as possible. You also want to be really professional and treat it like you will treat any other business. And uh, when you are talking to other people within your company to get their help or support, uh, make sure to personalize your presentation to the audience. Uh, a presentation will not be the same for HR than it will be for a business leader uh, because uh, as you can guess they will be interesting in different metrics different KPIs uh, which is another thing uh, make sure that whenever you discuss your project with someone the person you ask for help or support will benefit from your project too uh, always involve the person in charge of a topic in the discussion. Uh, trust me on this one, it will save you a lot of time. Also make sure that you have a way of onboarding people and giving them clear ways in which they can act. Uh, indeed, most of the time people want to help, they just don't know how or where to start. Also, most of the time what you are doing with your community will be on top of your job and it would require a lot of work. So you need to remind yourself that uh, you need to keep it light and enjoy what you are doing otherwise you will lose interest and motivation quite quickly. To me, the benefits from this community are multiple. Uh, the first one was obviously to find others within our company that wanted to act and uh, we started using our energy and passion towards something that was productive. Uh, we ended up working on quite a few projects and presentations to teach our colleagues more about sustainability. So this all led to the topic being more and more discussed in regular meetings and everyone starting to think more and more about it. Uh, and also our executives heard the employees speaking on this with a common and bigger voice. So they now know that it really matters to us. So now I let Stefan walk you through his parts on how you can engage your team towards the common goal. Wow, Lucille, thanks for your presentation. That's really so inspiring to, to hear it. Uh, you know, this is a great example to follow how to actually make something happen and, and, and create enthusiasm and, and motivating people to, to bring change, right? Uh, and also all those guidelines, I think we should really look more at those. Uh, I really see myself as a developer that sometimes I forget those. So always a great um, inspiration. So the next point that comes when you have created a community and 
you know, people are eager to act and share expertise. How do you actually manage to bring change in your product, in your offering, what you're actually doing for work, right? And this is very often where it gets difficult. But why is that actually so difficult to make it happen? Well, you know, one thing is that the dimension keep increasing. You have to take care about efficiency. You have to make your code secure, accessible. You know, your solution has to be ethical and so many other things, data privacy. It keeps getting more complex to solve, right? This is really a, a, a major hurdle. And also whether you want it or not, regulation is coming. Uh, this is an example of a GDPR here, but on the climate side as well, things are not slowing down at the opposite. They are getting faster and faster and the goals are getting stronger and stronger each year. So we really have to take new methods for that. We cannot just do it the, the old way and just say, yeah, look, We'll optimize a bit the front end and make the database a bit smaller, whatever, clean up a build the field. No, you really have to go to much greater length and rethink the way you work. One thing that I noticed though is that bad decisions are less visible at the granular level. And very often they are, you know, they are they are full of good intention. For example, you have this library that improves user experience, weights only 30 kilobytes. Uh, our page is already one megabyte, so this is not a big deal. And indeed, it would actually not be a big deal if that was the single thing happening, but there are five other teams that are seeing our change in their package. And so this is where you land with a two megabyte page. <laughs> so this is really, you know, the, the, the way the team works and, and the decisions are taking are just not helping a lot. So what you see here is that responsible computing is very much about discussing trade-offs. Recently, I also remember on the forum, someone saying, you know, developers actually know how to make code efficient. It's just the marketing team that comes after them that pull all those trackers and advertisements, and this makes the page then slow. And so that, that was an interesting thing for me because this was this made me think, okay, the, the, there seems to be a problem of alignment with the rest of the team. Like not the whole team is aligned on those goals. And if you have the only the developers who care about this, this won't work. And it looks to me like this is often a problem that happens in the team. You have either the developers or a special group of uh, interested people around ethic, around sustainability, around accessibility, depending on their own interest, but that doesn't map to the whole team. And so here in the last decade working with designers, I, I really learned a lot about how they think and how they have a different methods for uh, getting to success. And developer probably in my view, I have a lot to learn from this. So what do designers do? Generally, they don't accept to work on a single unit problem. They, most of the time, take a look at the bigger picture as the overall context of the problem. So for example, you would like to, uh, you would never ask an interior designer in your apartment to read you a, a door color. You know, you would at least ask them to redo one room. And then what they will do, they will look at the way you live, your, your style preferences, your budget, your house environment and all that, and, and come up to an overall solution. And so what about if we had the same view on those coding topics as well. You know, those, co those topics that actually we thought just touch the code, but actually they don't, they touch the whole team. And I think that's a general, a general thing in software right now that software actually touches the whole society. So 
it's not it's not a thing that's hidden anymore and so that's why also we have to rethink a bit about our responsibility in the world so how do designer work well they have different methods for example design thinking that you might have known or touch or try together already but in in our organization we have this fantastic guy called tom dayton and he used to work at the nasa and he used methods very similar to design thinking for working with engineers and um, project managers to actually clearly define a requirement across a broad set of organization and specialties and he taught me the word collaborative methods and so I search a bit more about this and this is very interesting. Collaborative methods, according to Wikipedia, are the process behavior and conversation that relate to the collaboration between individuals. This method specifically aims to increase the success of teams as they engage in collaborative problem solving. Well, this sounds very interesting. This is really about bringing the whole team together and having common decision in a way that's the most effective, that brings the best results, without wasting too much time, but at the same time, not letting good things on the table. So what are the base principles to make actually this work? Well, one of the things is that first, everyone has an equal voice. This is aimed at flattening the hierarchy. So of course, you cannot change everything. Loud people will probably stay loud. Quiet people will probably stay quiet a bit. But many of the process and methods in collaborative methods are actually made to, 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 to drastically reduce those kind of differences. Also, the facilitator has a big role to play in that uh, at helping this flattened hierarchy to stay. But still mainly having those new exercises, those new way of work that are not familiar to most of the team members is usually a good way to reset a bit the expectation. So that's the first thing. The next thing is that also IDs should be additive, means anyone's ID count, anyone's ID can be produced and put on the board. And if you disagree with uh, an ID, just write your own ID, but don't try to talk down the, the other IDs. And again, here the facilitator is here to prevent that kind of misbehavior. And with that context, the flatten hierarchy, the additivity of the IDs, you create a very safe environment where everyone can feel safe to be creative and, and, and propose things that it wouldn't have proposed in traditional meeting models. And so people contribute to a common board artifacts or present the artifacts on a regular basis so that everyone knows about what the other are doing on a permanent basis that enables everyone to learn on each other's and so everyone can iterate much faster because when you have 10 person iterating at the same time and quickly presenting what they have done, the learning effect in the team is way faster than when you wait just one day or even one week or two weeks as I see in some teams. And finally, clustering and voting, but there are also other methods, uh, help selecting the better ideas and that really helps alleviating the conflicts because when an ID gets the clear majority, usually there is no big discussion on that, that this is actually a valid point to, to be brought forward, or at least analyzed and validated to the next step. So what are collaborative methods that we can use? Well, there are quite, quite a few of them. And so this is a very short list here, but look at design thinking, for example, I'm, personally very proficient with design thinking, uh, working with it for the past six years, it's it served me very well. And it's it's always great with teams. It's very post-it oriented, as probably most of you know. Uh, but the name is a bit misleading. It would be actually more something like collaborative ID thinking. Liberating structure uh, offers a wide range of exercise that sometimes are pretty much different from design thinking, sometimes a bit more similar, uh, but they have also formats like one-on-one -on -one interviews and 
you know, like a model for ideas to bubble up uh, some kind of one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one discussions. So it, it's really interesting as well. And Lego sales play is also a very fun and interesting, maybe a bit more oriented toward team organization problems and so on, but still very interesting. Uh, and I think actually usable in a lot of different ways. Please don't call them workshops. Uh, workshops is, it has some connotation and especially one that I think is detrimental is that it make you think, yeah, you're going on this maybe, I don't know, one week retreat or so and doing a workshop and then you're done. And this would be like saying that you would work on your continuous integration for one sprint and then you, you just let it as is and, and don't work on improving it anymore. You will be leaving a lot of potential on the table in that case. So my recommendation is you try to use it on a regular basis, maybe, I don't know, once or twice a week at least, but in small bursts of one to two hours so people don't get burned out by it. Because believe me, when you are really into such kind of activities, this is very demanding. You have to be fully there. And so many people are not used to that. You constantly have to, to, to analyze the input of others and, and, and be creative. So this is really demanding, very demanding. You can, of course, start with a short workshop. Uh, it's always good for the base education, for, for getting the ball running at the start and, and setting the right goals. But then afterwards, you should really make it a process inside your team. So at IBM, we actually use even uh, design thinking for designing AI concepts. Uh, we personally, in my team, we used it for designing the, uh, the Overwatch uh, power ranking with IBM Watson, for example. Um, so this is a method that I know works really well. And the advantage of that method is that you bring everyone together on the product managers, the designers, the data scientists, the developers, the marketing, and you discuss together about the feasibility, the pro and cons of each ID, and you try to be to be to be creative and bold, and then bring it back to what's to actually doable. And you also look at the ethical aspect of the solution. What could go wrong? You know, what could be the de detrimental aspects for the user for the business and also for the society as a whole. So for me, this, this method is a great guideline on how we could build it out and actually use it for all kind of responsible computing topic. So collaborative methods are still no magic. I think they are very useful. They are a, a, a major tool and very important, but they are no magic. For example, they highly depend on the facilitator you have on board, right? But still, they will help you become a responsible team faster. And how? Actually, by taking better decision, because they will look at the full picture in your own context. So you will really be able to, at designing and crafting the best solution for you what your team can actually accomplish and will allow everyone to look in the different dimension. And also those methods are very fun. So usually they improve the team spirits and they allow everyone to have a voice. They allow the whole team to know who, whose strength is in what area and they improve the network inside the team. So very often they shorten the communication path afterwards and also the decision path in further decision. So they have really good side benefits. So with that known, I hope that you are able now to make better progress on your quest to become more responsible and sustainable. And let's do that together. Thank you all.